Welcome, friends, to Episode 2 of Heart Forward Conversations from the Heart. This week, I am happy to meet with Savannah Walseth, someone I've known for many years in Hollywood dating back to 2012. That was when she first arrived as an outreach worker. We worked together in our homeless coalition, Hollywood Forward, and she was part of the original Hollywood Top 14 team, which sought to help the most seriously mentally ill people, those most likely to die on the streets. I place Savannah in this very special club of talented and committed people doing outreach on the streets, connecting with the most vulnerable. She is a kindred soul to Anthony Ruffin, whom I interviewed for episode six in season two. Savannah is not one to give up on people, and she falls into that category of doing whatever it takes for as long as it takes to build rapport, trust, and a pathway to recovery from one's mental illness. Savannah is wise beyond her years, informed by a professional and academic journey so far that has afforded her more life experiences in 10 years than some might experience in a lifetime. And now she is in law school because she wants to advocate for change through our legal systems. In this interview, we are going to unpack a paper she wrote in a mental disability law seminar about California's conservatorship law and ideas that she has for change. Hey, Savannah, good morning. It's so, so good to see you. Welcome to Heart Forward. We've always had a chance to talk on the things that we care passionately about, but today we're going to put a little structure to it and try to have this conversation in about uh, 50 minutes so we can bring um, people current on what you're working on and catch up on, you know, the things that you've been doing during the pandemic even, which has been pretty fascinating from what I understand. So Savannah, let's just start and kind of introduce you to our listening community. Tell me a little bit about your origin story, where you grew up, how you arrived in California. I remember I met you when you were a door dweller, which was maybe 2013-ish or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, take us on that story up to where you are today. Yeah, thank you. I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, so way out there in the Midwest, And I was graduated high school. And at that point, the idea for my parents was I was going to go to college because that's what my mom worked at a university. That's what people do. And I kind of said, no, I want a gap year. And that scared everybody a little bit. But I was pretty, uh, some would say stubborn, but some others would say um, just passionate about what I wanted to do. And I wanted to take at least a year spending time going elsewhere, getting out of North Dakota and kind of figuring out who I was. So I joined a program called DOOR. Um, It is no longer in LA to the same extent, though it is across the country in different cities. What does DOOR stand for? Discovering Opportunities for Outreach and Reflection. A big mouthful of a name, but it's a really cool program uh, that came out of the Presbyterian Church and the Mennonite Church and They wanted to bring young adults to communities that were underserved across the United States and be able to, we all have um, internships during the day. And then at night, we do a community house. And what that means is bring in kids from the community, bring in parents from the community, and be able to really try to bridge that gap between, you know, more privileged kids from other parts of the U.S. to these communities that really welcomed us in. And so we did tutoring and field trips and learned how to make tamales and did all of the above. And that was in Hollywood. That was in Hollywood, Hollywood and kind of the southern part of Hollywood. Okay. Yep. I was the youngest one of the group. So I was right out of high school. Everybody else was either halfway through college or most of them had finished college. And what I learned later is usually it's folks finishing college, but I was just adamant that uh, that I would go at that age. And there was pros and cons of that, definitely. But I think it was super instrumental of who I am and what I want to do today. We all got assigned internships. And that, I didn't have much of a choice because there were some internships, they were like, you, we'd really like you to be older, for example. So there's a drop-in center for young adults in Hollywood. Well, they didn't want somebody that close in age to the folks there. So they were like, Path would maybe be a good fit. And so So I didn't know people assisting the homeless. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was an outreach worker. And at that. And what year would that have been? 2012. Yep. Um, And so I got placed there. And that was a really, 
unique, but I think great experience for me to just go out with one other person. And they were like, build relationships with the people on the streets, hand out sandwiches. And we were like, I don't really know what I'm doing, but let's try this and let's see what we can do. Um, And from those very early weeks, I think was my first idea that, oh, I, I really like this. I particularly started building relationships with individuals that had severe mental illness on the street, had chronic health conditions, substance use issues. And that's kind of who I built my, what we would now called kind of a caseload, but we didn't think of it that way back then. And those were the individuals that I come back to day after day and say, what can we do for this person? And I go to my supervisor and he's like, there's some things, but it's complicated, Savannah. I'd go, come on, there's got to be something here. And that was kind of what my the individuals that I ended up really working with and um, enjoying that work with. And we're going to talk about a couple of those people mm-hmm. today. But I do kind of remember, and I don't know what year this would have been, you, you stayed in this work longer than you expected. Your gap year became like a gap two years. Two years. And I remember <laughs> being part of a team to really encourage you, you got to go to college now and (laughs) you didn't want to. So (laughs) what happened? And then you did end up going. So tell us that part of the story. (laughs) Yes, sure. Well, so it was after the end of my first year that I went, it's really hard during that year to also be then thinking about applying to colleges. When I looked at my options, I said, and I went to you, I went to uh, Spencer Downing, I'll say, at the center was a really big impact because that second year, he made me sit down with him multiple times throughout that year working on applications, (laughs) Um, as well as a few others being like, you can do so much more if you have a bachelor's degree. And and I agreed. I did some community college classes that second year, which is really helpful because then when I did go to college, I had some credits and that kind of thing. It was at the end of that second year that I went okay, I'm ready to kind of get out of here. Um, I was even only two years in, I was already getting a little burnt out, a little like, I don't know. I think I was just so young and didn't have great boundaries. I didn't have great, didn't have the great skill set yet. So I was still learning. And I decided to go to Reed College in Portland. That was, Spencer helped me choose that site, uh, that place too. Uh, He was like, you got to go somewhere that can really make you think differently and that you can try things and see what fits and all of that. And I loved going to read. I thought that was a great fit for me. And didn't you go overseas at some point while you were there? I did. I got a fellowship called the just the Winter International Fellowship. And it was kind of a build your own adventure, and which is the coolest thing ever for a school to do. They gave us money to, and we made a proposal to them. And I proposed to go to India. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to go from one side of India to the other side. I went to four main cities, some others in there, but four main ones over the course of a month by myself. And the goal was to look at mental health care in the country. Um, And it was really the coolest trip I've ever been on, um, partially because it was was solo and I just got to explore and understand. Um, I went to a conference there that really looked at traditional healing as a method of how do we look at that compared to our Western ideas of mental health. That was fascinating to look at how do you bring both together and how do we not just steal ideas like yoga and just assume that it works for everybody rather than saying, what are the real roots of yoga that actually looks at the day-to-day methodology of how you live your life and give back rather than stretches? And yet on the other side, how do some of the some of the young um, students there came to me and were like, "We want a Western mal- a Western system just like you guys for mental health." I'm like, ooh, I don't know if you want that. <laughs> Maybe something that is a combination. Yeah, of the two. I would say <laughs> think about what you guys like. What's good about your culture and world, and think about like how you can bring in parts of ours. But it, it's got to be more than that. I did some. Uh, dancing for mental health, which is really fascinating. We have an expert in from India that that does it all over the all over the country. I got to meet people that really saw stuff like um, the way schizophrenia is looked at in India, 
the way individuals hear voices look really differently in different cultures. And I found that really fascinating. I think we often just think they look one way. That's not necessarily true. And there's some really interesting studies you can look at to say- It's so amazing that at such a formative time in your career, you could actually exit the United States and, and exit a Western model and see these other these other confluences that are so important. I mean, imagine all the people who never even get to do that. Yeah. What an amazing opportunity. It was such a great experience. So when you came back, uh, you graduated from Reed. And then I do recall- you were working at some very innovative, like, women's village for women mm-hmm. who were formerly homeless. Yes. What was that? Yeah. So I got a job. We created the first – it was a hybrid model of – it was tiny houses uh, that kind of looked like some of the tiny houses here in L.A. that they're starting to pop up. But these were built by designers who all wanted to kind of, like, share that their model was best. So you've got all different types of these houses that um, we let the women paint them and decorate them. And the idea was that this is not a model just, this was not supposed to be a shelter. This was for the women in the community. We would bring them in, only ones that lived in that little neighborhood, all different levels of vulnerability. We had some that were had really severe stuff going on and then people that could maybe hold down a job or something like that um, and bring them together and let them do some level of self-governance. So the idea that they should be able to make the decisions about what rules should happen there, what security should look like, should you be allowed to have guests, should you be allowed, what can you do in your home versus the community room? Is it okay if you have alcohol in there? Really let them figure that out. I love it. It's such a Trieste approach of self-governance and actually trusting people to make decisions about their community and each other, which we, we don't do. We, yeah. we, we, have, we set up pallet home shelters here, which are great, but they're not allowed to decorate them differently mm-hmm. or the rules are established by the nonprofit and it takes away agency from the very people living there. But yeah. that must have been a just eye-opening experience for you as a college grad. Oh, definitely. I wanted to come in and like, at first it was it was a different environment for me. I came from... At Reed, I was working at like crisis shelters and things like that for youth. So I was coming from a shelter head for a while. And I came in and was like, this is not my place. My role is to come in and be a a facilitator as well as be the advocate when the city or the nonprofit or the uh, an activist group did something they didn't like. I was there to just help them lift their voices to communicate to that and then just make sure that it was calm in the in the community in general. But it, it, there was in uncomfortable environments, but I think that's good. Mm-hmm. Some of the uncomfortability was when they would be like, it's okay for us to, uh, you know what, if if we want to have a beer in our house, and I'd go, oh, really? But I'd go, okay, let's try it. Let's try it. And if anything goes wrong, and I will not see a beer in the community room, only in your house, and you cannot come out, Drinking, you need to let me know if anything gets out of control and how do we manage that? But it was a good experience. It was chaos at times, but good chaos, I think, because that's part of how you build community in any environment. Exactly. So then at some point, then you made the decision to head back to L.A. again. Yes. Uh, Yeah, I was only at the village a year. And I think part of that was I brought it up like from from babyhood to toddler to felt like it was a, like a teenager. And I was like, okay, I need to let go of this because I want to go back. And my ultimate goal was to go back to school. And so I was like, let me transition back to LA. Um, that's really where I still had so many friends and people I work with and all of that. So I went back to LA and I got a job at the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority as an outreach coordinator. So I went from a path There was probably 40 outreach workers on the street. So when I came back to L.A., it was over 600 outreach workers on the street. And what year was that that you came back? 2017. So by then, Measure H had passed. And so there was more funding for outreach. Yes, significant funding. Right. Yeah. So you were at LASA for a while yep. and then ended up at the Department of Health? Yes, Department of Health Services, Housing for Health. Mm-hmm. Um, and I transitioned there partly because it was going to be a more stable environment for me to go to law school at the same time. 
And I love working at Department of Health Services. That's where I've I've been ever since um, until I, I left in December. But yeah, I, I was worked in their interim housing department. Um, and then I moved to their street outreach department and then their COVID response environment. I took a little longer on your story because you're a young person. And I think it shows just the scope and breadth of your experience going back 10 years or so. You have been in the trenches at so many different kind of levels that it it gives you great authority to weigh in on some of the things we're going to talk about today because you yeah. have you have been with people through a <laughs> pandemic through living on the streets through trying to navigate uh, managing a tiny village it's it, you've been to India <laughs> it just, <laughs> you're, it's the, your scope of of uh, background is pretty impressive so before we get started now you you decided to go to law school and was that something that you knew you wanted to do when you were at Reed or you decided later what what was the inspiration for applying. Yeah, I knew I wanted to do a graduate program of some sort, but I wasn't really sure where to go. And I felt like I wanted to make as big of a difference as I could make and really tackle these problems that we're going to be talking about today. And all of the the routes that I was looking at seemed like it wouldn't really get me there. But I was really excited by the idea of law as it's really, it has a large breadth and it has a lot of ability to make a direct difference. It has a level of kind of authority to it um, because it you can really understand some of these issues at a deeper level. So that was really my reasoning. So you're at Loyola Law School mm-hmm. and what, two years into the program? Uh, three years and I have one year left. Oh. It was an evening program. So it's a four-year program. And is there a particular kind of theme or track that you're you're pursuing? So I'm a public interest scholar, which just meant that I came in with my public interest experience and it came with scholarships and that sort of thing. Um, But I really want to focus on civil rights litigation because I really feel like to tackle some of these issues, like litigation is one way to do that. Maybe that won't be forever, but I'm really, I really like the idea of kind of going that route right now. So you had sent me back before Christmas, a paper that you had written for for one of your classes, and it was on California's conservatorship law, the LPS Act, Lannerman Petra Short, and that you had identified a couple of different ways that you thought maybe conservatorship law could be applied with respect to people with serious mental illness and grave disability, which we'll, we'll go into. And as I read your report, I thought, you know, there's so much confusion out there about what is a conservatorship, how are they applied, how long do they last, et cetera. And I thought, you know, I'm going to use Savannah's paper and this opportunity to talk to you to just make this almost like a primer on this law, which is so confusing. And it's actually applied differently sometimes from county Mm -hmm. to county. But let's do one more like history lesson check. You and I worked together back in 2013 in Hollywood. Uh, You were still a door dweller. And we had put together a group of people that we called the Hollywood Top 14 in 2013. And I know you were very much involved with that. It was very obvious to, to us who these people were, highly vulnerable likely to die on the streets unless there was some kind of intervention. And it was from that, I know you got one of your case studies. What I want to do is have you share your two case studies because you, one one gentleman is Ron and the other person is Anthony and tell those two stories and then we're going to we're going to keep circling back to them because the outcomes in their lives were completely different. Mm-hmm. So tell us about Ron. And I remember exactly who you are (laughs) referring to. He was one of the original Hollywood top 14. Yeah. So Ron um, was sometimes called Santa Claus on the streets uh, when people didn't know his name because he had a long beard, shaggy gray hair. He'd often wear lots of clothing. So like sweatshirts, jackets, that kind of thing, even when it was really hot outside, um, like L.A. hot. He was known both in Hollywood and Santa Monica. He would just jump on buses and the bus drivers kind of just let him. He'd go back and forth between the two. He often ate out of garbage cans um, and slept on park benches. Sometimes I'd go to a soup kitchen or two, like a couple places that knew him. Um, There's a church that he'd sometimes go to that kind of knew him there, but wouldn't talk to anybody. Um, Was really in in his own head and 
would sometimes take off running and sometimes even run into to a street if you weren't careful. I started to get to know him really well. And there was a time where I was alerted by, I believe it was our, our bid officers in the area said, I think Ron's not looking very good. And I said, okay. So I went over to check him out and everything started swelling in his face. His face was super swelled up. And I brought over a mental health worker and was like, is there anything we can do here? And they're like, no, I mean, if he doesn't want to get in an ambulance, there's nothing we can do. Like, he's what it is. And he's telling me that it's allergies. And maybe it is allergies. And I'm going, that's not allergies. It's pretty obvious. So all I could do was just go back day after day. The next day, his eyes had swollen shut. And his face was really swelling. And I brought an ambulance out. And they said, I can't force him in. And he was still on the same park bench. And then the next day, I called the ambulance again. And they said, I think we ended up calling like a captain or something. And we brought him to the hospital. And the hospital made us wear like full garb getting in to see him. Because they're like, he has a bunch of infectious diseases, scabies. There's all stuff going on. And I'm like, okay. And I said, can you make sure at the end of the day, make sure that you let me know. Keep him overnight. I will see what we can do in the morning. And they're like, yeah, there's nothing we can do. That night he was left, he was kicked out of the hospital at some point, probably near midnight. And we found him the next day on a park bench and he'd passed away right outside the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. I remember this person and I remember seeing him deteriorate. And, you know, we were all asking the question, like, why is it so hard to help someone like this? And I recall that in your report, you said something to the effect that the clinical people who are clinically trained said that he was not considered disabled enough because he was able to get food out of a mm -hmm. trash can or somehow take care of himself. And so it did not qualify to hit the threshold of what would have been required for a mental health hold. Yeah. Food, clothing, shelter. That's what we look at. Well, he eats. It seems like he's eating. He's eating out of garbage can. Okay, shelter, no, but he's under a bus bench and that bus bench has an awning. I'm like, well, that's just random. He doesn't know that it has an awning. And then clothing, well, he's wearing clothing. And I go, well, it's inappropriate clothing. And they're like, well, I don't know if that really counts. And so that's where we're kind of stuck in those situations. So here's a person who clearly was deteriorating on the street and ends up in the hospital and gets released and dies. So we're going to hold on to Ron's story. And then the other story you shared as a kind of a disparate case study was that of Anthony. Talk a little bit about Anthony. Yeah. Anthony, I got a call from, or maybe it was one of my teams got a call um, from a politician that saw Anthony right near outside of his office. And that's pretty common. You got somebody that's annoying the people outside of there. So we're going to go out and see what we can do. Anthony's kind of running around. He uses substances of some sort, and he's kind of all over the place. African-American male. He's in his 30s, not wearing a shirt. And, you know, uh, he'll take food from folks, but he can go buy his own food, too, if we give him money. And over the course of time, start to get to know him. And we're like, why won't you go into, like, a shelter or something? And he goes, well, I'm scared of shelters. I'm scared of people all around me. I don't like it. I'm like, well, what else can we do to help you? And he starts to give us ideas. We're really starting to build trust. And the next day we go out and he's gone. And I call around and the politician had called out a mental health team. And that team had put him on a hold. And once I followed up over time, he was conserved. Okay. So one person died and another person was placed under a conservatorship. And, mm -hmm. um, okay. So let's, let's, let's now go just to the basics of what is the Lanterman Petrus short act? Why was it enacted and what does it in essence do? Yeah, this act was put together after deinstitutionalization, which I think you've talked about enough on here. The idea Late was- Late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. yeah. Idea, let's let's get people out of institutions. There's abuse going on. There's a lot of things going on. And so the idea of this act, it was really revolutionary for the time. California was the first place to really look at how do we do this differently and how do we do this better? And they put together committees to put together a new law around how to 
take care of the welfare of the individuals that needed it due to um, severe mental illness as well as other disabilities, protect public safety, and make sure that um, we could keep people in the community. One of the big pieces that they worked on was this concept of grave disability. And you can put somebody on a hold. A hold is, and when we we refer to that as 5150, but that's the particular section of the Welfare and Institutions Code, right, where this this law lodges. Yeah, it's also, I often call it assessment and evaluation, because that's really what it's supposed to be, but we all call it 5150, Mm -hmm. or a 72-hour hold. There's three ways to put somebody on a hold, uh, danger to self, danger to others, or grave disability. And grave disability is really what the main thing that we've, that I've been writing about and that we've been talking to. And the specific wording is a condition in which a person as a result of a mental disorder is unable to provide for their basic needs for food, clothing, shelter. So they have a mental health disorder and food, clothing, and shelter is what they cannot provide for. Um, That's a really vague kind of thing, isn't it? Like it's, it's something that's very, their idea is that this would be really rare. That you would never use this. Yeah, and and you indicated in your paper. I, I, I found this fascinating that in the legislative record, which sometimes you go back to to try to understand, well, what what was the legislature intending when they passed this law? So it's like the background notes that only one example was provided <laughs> to kind of provide some light, and it was a young man who becomes uncommunicative, refuses to eat or leave his room, and begins to soil himself. Mm-hmm. That was the example they used. That is now going to govern all of the decisions that have to be made about whether or not a person should be placed on an involuntary hold. Yeah. And and we're giving these decisions, remember, to mostly police officers and social workers. I love Alex Bernard in your last podcast talked about street-level bureaucrats, which I learned a lot about in sociology. And these are the the individuals making these bureaucratic decisions, and they're the ones defining gravely disabled on the streets with only food, shelter, clothing, which are terms that vary culture to culture and everything else. Yeah, I will say, Savannah, that on my personal journey in learning about this, which kind of, you know, started almost the same time as as yours, I remember calling someone at at the Department of Mental Health because I was so frustrated about a, a person who was continually being released from the emergency room and in my lay person's opinion, did not feel like they were capable of taking care of themselves. And I remember this particular person said, well, you know, if we walk out to that person living on the street and hand him a hamburger and he eats it, the food issue is taken care of. I said, no, but he can't go get it himself, right? Yeah. So this is the conundrum that we've been operating under. So kind of picking up on what you just said about the the police officer. So the current law has this kind of initial what you would describe as the assessment and evaluation phase. And it could be a police officer or it could be a a licensed social worker. And you indicated in your paper that if a police officer encounters, let's say they encountered Ron and they were then to take them to the hospital, they can't leave, right? Mm -hmm. So there's really no incentive. It, It takes them out of the field, out of the patrol car, sometimes waiting at the hospital for hours yep. for the hospital to determine whether or not they're actually going to accept that person. Yep. Right? And a lot of times the hospital, due to beds or just because they don't agree with the police officer, at that point will just say, nope, we can't take him. We made that decision. And so now the police officer knows I did all of that and they're back on the street. Right. So what's the point? So that's also an important thing. The 5150 technically is supposed to lead to a 72-hour hold which what is supposed to happen during the 72 hours and how often do people actually stay for 72 hours? It is up to 72 hours. That's the big thing. So they have 72 hours to evaluate and assess the individual to see whether they should go on to a 15 day or 14 day hold. So everybody's surprised when somebody gets let out after 24 hours. But the idea is well, if they're looking good at 24 hours, there's no reason to hold them longer. So that's why often people are are being kicked out at weird hours in the day or night or any of that to get back to where they were. Yeah. So also the other thing you mentioned, and I, I didn't ever realize this before, so help me 
if if I if I read this wrong, you indicated that the way the current law is written, the criteria is that a person is unable to provide for food, clothing, or shelter. Mm-hmm. You're a law student now. What's the significance of that choice? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's saying that technically speaking, it's only one of those criteria that has to be looked at. So if the person just can't handle their food or just can't deal with shelter, just can't deal with uh, clothing, when you're actually talking to folks on the street, these street level bureaucrats, as I'll say, Mm -hmm. um, they're almost always using that as an and, as it has to be all three. But that's actually not the case if you look at the statute. Yeah. So it leaves a lot of discretion Mm -hmm. when you look at those three elements and also you indicated that there's some research that from 2016 when the frequency of 5150 holds in emergency rooms throughout California was evaluated, there appears to be some some racial bias happening there. Definitely. So I don't have the exact stats, but I do see that there's big discrepancy in race. Yeah, and- I, I actually captured that because oh, okay. I read your report so many times. So Blacks and Hispanics were 57% and 154%, so Blacks 57%, Hispanics 154% more likely to be placed on a 5150 hold than non-Hispanic whites. Yeah, and I think some of that's discretionary. I think that there are things that um, when a white police officer looks at a Black man that um, seems to, in his mind, seem crazy, they might be more likely to put that person on a hold whether than a white man that they have things like that. I think when we're talking about this bigger issue of police brutality, police, everything going on with police, I think there's some big questions there of whether this is the best way to go. And because there is so much discretion, there's automatically going to be bias, just as, as if you might not relate to the person the same. Yeah. And I think you and I both agree that the sooner we can move law enforcement out of this role, yes. the better. Yes. So we're anxiously awaiting the arival of alternative crisis response yep. and that because that's such an important part of this discussion. So important. Right. So you're proposing that in this initial evaluation and assessment phase, that maybe there should be a uh, a new definition, um, a better way to kind of assess the situation at at that point of being on the street or maybe in somebody's home. And what what are you proposing? Yeah, I think the idea is why are we using this same vague one sentence definition for both this to get somebody assessed and evaluated for that seventy two hour versus this longer conservatorship type situation. Because don't we want almost more people to just like quickly come in and so we can make sure that they're safe and good? And I think it comes with more than that, which we'll get into. But really, why don't we make it much more specific, much more specific to help street level bureaucrats have more boundaries over the term so they're not just using it whenever? Um, And so some specific things are we should look a little bit more at somebody's history when we have it in front of us. So do they have previous 5150s? Can we get history from a family, friend, social worker really quickly in front of us rather than just taking our eyes and looking at the person? And if not, I let one area go where let's look at this person's thought processes, behaviors, emotional affects. So you have to give some specifics about why this individual should go in. And then really the goal is to look at somebody's health, safety, quality of life is significantly endangered is the other piece that I think is really important. And they lack some capacity to do so. And I think those are types of things. And I think with examples for individuals, we may get closer to what we want to see in that initial phase. So just using that, if your proposed definition was operating at the time of Ron, who was deteriorating with now what appears to have been internal infections and you know other things causing the puffiness on his face yeah. and his eyes close, um, closing, et cetera. There was no real attempt to look at his history, mm-hmm. uh, you know, w- where he had been other times he maybe had been hospitalized, whether he had other, ever been on a conservatorship. And there was no attempt to find his family, which is something I feel very strongly about. It's something I definitely saw in Italy. The family is always involved. Mm-hmm. And and you and I both kind of intuitively in some of the 
Hollywood top 14 cases would try to find people's family. Mm -hmm. And that would shed light on the person and what happened and how they arrived in LA. And sometimes uh, would surface family members who'd be willing to help in some way. I know family members, uh, you know, of adults with adult children with with, uh, mental illness are very frustrated that they are not allowed to weigh in more on the situation that's in front of them. You have kind of bifurcated this journey as the evaluation phase just to kind of lead to a hold, whether it's a short-term hold or a 14-day hold. But then there's that next step, which is uh, should this person be placed under a longer-term care of the public guardian or conservator? Mm -hmm. So let's just clean up some language here on what a conservatorship is because there's been this um you know social media push on you know free Britney Spears and Britney Spears was under a long-term conservatorship under her father which for all intents and purposes looking from the outside seemed incredibly unfair and it cannot or should not be confused with the type of conservatorship mm-hmm. we're talking about today with people with serious disabilities. So can you tease out the difference yes. between the two? So Britney Spears was under a probate conservatorship. And the goal of a probate conservatorship, there are two main factors under it. You can have a conservatorship of the person and a conservatorship of the estate. She had both. And really, the main goals of a probate is to control somebody's money and their estates, and their wills, and their basic medical care in order for somebody not to have undue influence or have somebody that's um, neglect or abuse or that kind of thing. It's a little bit different. There's a separate code, all of that for that. And one big thing that you just mentioned is that it's really forever. There's no like reevaluation once you're under this conservatorship, unless there is, they can petition to get out of it. There's some processes there. But that's the big difference compared to an LPS, which is what we're talking about. Okay. And that is one year, and then it's reevaluated every year. The other big difference here is that a probate that Brittany's under is there's no ability to be in a locked facility like there is under an LPS conservatorship. And there's also no for psychiatric medication. So Brittany cannot have um, medication that kind of thing. But Brittany can have medical care. So there's this whole thing about her having an IUD. um, And that is something her father can do. The other big thing here is under a probate, anyone can petition anybody else to be under a a probate. This LPS that we're talking about, you have to go through the hospital system, this whole thing, and a public guardian kind of runs this system. Over here, the probate system Anybody can petition and anybody can be the conservator. So I could petition on behalf of you if you, let's say, were elderly and had lost your mental faculties and we wanted to make sure your mortgage got paid. I could petition the court. We don't need to go down that road. Yeah. <laughs> that road but it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. So I, I would, dementia, that's a huge one there. And then the second one is uh, developmental disabilities mm-hmm. are really common. Um, When somebody turns 18, you might want to put somebody under a conservator. So those are the most common things. Okay. So we'll get that out of the way. That's a subject for another another talk. By the way, before we jump into the LPS conservatorship, there was something I I did want to ask you about your proposed new definition. You indicated that in the way that you would like to see the evaluation uh, of the 5150 play out, it would allow family members to support the person without being penalized. Describe more what you're thinking there. Yeah. So there is a, uh, this has been called out in a variety of environments in in courts. There's all types of court cases around this, around what role should a family be able to play in helping an individual. And I think it should look slightly different in the assessment phase versus this conservatorship phase. I wrote in here, the individual without significant supervision and assistance from another person is unable to provide for their basic needs. And so you can take that into account that if somebody's helping them, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't still be evaluated. Because that, I've, I've heard that from family members that felt that what they had to do to help their adult child was to let them become homeless, to show that they were unable to take care of themselves which would be a horrific thing to expect a family member to do. Yeah. And it's really the problem too, is a lot of these are based on court cases that 
like the people making these decisions are not necessarily describing them the right way either. So they may take it wrong and not evaluate the person correctly. So it's really complicated. The goal of making that change was to do what I'm going to show in the conservatorship phase, which is we should allow family members to petition the court and say, this person doesn't need a conservatorship because I am willing to take the role in helping them. And that I think should be allowed. If you get it in writing, the family wants to do that. That's a very different scenario than the one you're describing that is the opposite. They can't where they have their hands yes. off. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's segue into this, this, what you would call the tier two, which is actually now the potentially one year option to place uh, an individual under a LPS conservatorship. Describe what the powers are of the conservator relative to the conservatee under a LPS conservatorship. Yeah. So like we already mentioned, they um, control psychiatric medication or have a doctor that does that, um, they can put the person in any type of home or environment that they think is fit, that is usually a locked facility, but can be unlocked, can be a boarding care. Their uh, medical care is taken care of, financial situation, all of those types of day-to-day needs um, is really supposed to be in the hands of a public guardian. Then again, what we've seen is often public guardian may not even have because they don't have staffing, because of whatever it is, may not even actually meet with the person for months and months at a time into their conservatorship. So this idea that the LPS Act is saying individual supervision, individual treatment, all of these things don't often come into fruition. Yeah. So you mentioned in your paper that the goal of of the LPS conservatorship is to, quote, ameliorate the conservatee's grave disability But what constitutes amelioration? Well, and the other thing is the courts have decided that a conservatorship has no right to treatment, that there actually isn't a right for an individual to get true treatment under this. The idea is simply holding them for a year is fine. And that's that's something that that needs to be fought because we, we really should be looking to make people better rather than just trying to kind of keep them away or separate for a year. I I know you and I share kind of a similar kind of conundrum in this space. I I recall talking with people in Trieste where they were surprised that we in the United States would so easily gravitate toward placing people in locked institutions because they believe in no locked doors. There are no locked doors in Trieste and they do not use restraints. So the challenge is that our system has devolved to such a place where it, we're, we're, we're kind of like in the pit of despair there. Uh, but we have seen that it, we could do it differently. We could, we could do better. So right now, the option that we've seen so often is people do end up in a locked facility. And you have said in your paper that in this evaluation stage, this should be a gateway to different kinds of options for an individual which might include conservatorship or something less Mm -hmm. intensive, a a less restrictive alternative. But as we know, and as Alex Barnard in his podcast last season mentioned, we don't have enough of those options. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit more about that. It's a forced choice in some respects right now. Absolutely. And that's been a whole thing in court cases too that I've looked at into what that we should have a least restrictive alternative. And that was really, I mean, Supreme Court said that, that there should be a least restrictive alternative. However, it's not a mandate to what that is or who should pay for it or who should provide it and what that looks like. And so what we have is we put somebody on a hold in this hospital and they're either forced to go through this conservatorship route or they go back on the streets. And it's kind of this terrible conundrum The really... An LPS conservatorship should only be for the most severe cases, the most chronically ill that are going to die on our streets or die in our homes. And then we would probably have enough beds. Maybe we need a little bit more. But if we truly got the people out that didn't need to be there and got them better places, we would maybe be okay. The problem is we really should have the public guardian coming out at that 72-hour phase as that's kind of their role and trying to divert people into the least restrictive alternative. 
they don't have the time capacity, the staffing, or maybe even the ability to do that. So one proposal I had that's not perfect, but just an idea, because I think we need creative ideas, is why do we make LPS designated facilities all hospitals? Mm. Why don't we have small kind of centers in most communities of like 20 beds where officers or social workers or whoever can bring individuals It has peer support and social workers where they can try to divert individuals and we can create more type of step down types of things. Um, They could stay there for the 14 days and those that really need it can either go to a hospital or conservatorship. So something more like a crisis residential or peer respite that doesn't feel so clinical and institutional you could continue to work on the relationship, you know, mm-hmm. in the case that the relationship you had with Ron, mm-hmm. imagine if he, I it just it, paint a picture, like where do you wish you could have taken Ron and you think because you had created a day by day relationship with him, he would have gone where it could have gone differently. Paint, paint that picture. Yeah. I mean, I think there needs to be places that are, are very, um, I think there's two levels. If you want to go more the legal, like we have to put them on hold or something, which sometimes you do, then a type of center where there are beds, there are, it's a low barrier in the sense of there's not strict rules, there's not strict things. Um, It's a place where people can sleep, they can eat, they can um, see a doctor, they can see a psychiatrist, that type of thing. But also we're looking at what's better for them. And then divert, I wish there were places like group homes that were actually not the group homes we have today. I've seen a lot of luck in some of our boarding cares, our good boarding cares, not our not so good boarding cares. So maybe describe, I agree, uh, describe the difference between a good and a not so good boarding care. (laughs) Yes. Well, I think the biggest difficulty is the boarding cares that are not so good just don't have the money. And so they're, they're working off a really small social security check. $35 a day. Yes. Yeah. Um, to work with a very severely sick individual. And so they just can't do everything. And so I don't blame the facilities. Some of them are really good because they have money, for example, through Housing for Health <laughs> that's able to supplement that money or through DMH, Department of Mental Health. And they're able to supplement that money um, through some special programs, enriched residential care, to be able to give them some money to be able to t- take some case managers on, to take some substance use individuals on, to be able to really provide a more roundabout program. And I also wish more of these would think about how do we bring in the the, the patients to have a say in in what's going on there and have groups and that kind of thing. But course, right now they can't afford it. I'm sure some of them would love to. Yeah. Uh, so I always, um, <laughs> I say that if I had a billionaire approach me and ask, what would I like to see tested or piloted? Let me see if you would agree. And then you and I could ask this mysterious billionaire together. Mm-hmm. I would like to see a large house purchased that is not a doesn't feel like a board and care, but feels more like a family style home where people could have a room to themselves, or maybe share a room if it's a big room, but shared communal kitchen, chores, your, tonight's your night to cook dinner or do the dishes, a garden in the back, a, a dog at the front door, you know, family meetings about how to run the house. This is what I would love to see. And I, and I, I know you, you and I both know people who are formerly on the top 14 list who could live in a place like that mm-hmm. and thrive. Yeah. But it's not in our housing continuum. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing quite like that for our, our, our severe individuals, our chronically homeless, that type of thing. I've seen it and I've seen models like that work, like Portland, not for those with severe mental illness, but like elderly women that were all homeless, that we were able to all put in a house and do that kind of model. And I think that kind of thing could definitely work, but I I think there's, there's a lack of creativity in LA. Mm. I really do around homelessness. I think we're not looking at enough what other states are doing. I think we're stuck in this model of like emergency shelter rather than thinking about all these other things that we could do in how we make our facilities, how we think about creating a a model of people like getting better and moving on to the next step. 
um, I think a lot of that is kind of missing right now. Oh, that's so interesting. I just think that what you've brought even from Portland is, has been useful. You know, we, we do get stuck in a rut here. We don't have necessarily the best answers in Los Angeles County. So talking about funding again, I think your desires are in the right place to see these least restrictive alternatives made available so people do not end up in locked facilities, which are not hospitable in any sense of the equation. What kind of hope do you have or what kind of policy changes do you think are on the horizon that might give us some hope that we could see some change in this space? Yeah, um, I think there's some really, I think it's hard to say that there's there's hope. There's a lot of things that I want to see, and I really hope that they can come about. Well, you have a long career ahead of you, and you're going to be a <laughs> yes. lawyer, so go ahead and just set your agenda. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I would like to see from a law perspective, like what I would be really interested in working on is how do we make a demand to like California, our state, and say that we have a duty to assist, provide community-based care, and least restrictive alternatives that are more than just LPS to the most severe mentally ill individuals on these streets. And there really should be a duty. Like, that seems really straightforward legally. It's been fought in the past, but I think there's now some new momentum and new judges there that we can start to bring these answers. I think that there's really some new hope. There's a lot of interest in homelessness right now. And I worry that this interest is is negative in the fact of we're just looking at emergency housing. And I want people to think about folks like Ron. And when they say, oh, we offered everyone housing, did we really offer Ron housing before we moved people? Because I don't think we did. I'm really excited about this new movement to get mental health workers uh, or alternatives to policing on our streets. I think that's really exciting. And I think I'm much more hopeful than I was. Like, you know, that first year I was at PATH and it was just these two outreach workers on the streets. And I had this kind of caseload and I had 12 individuals die on our streets that year. Wow. For a 19-year-old, I was 19 at the time, 12 of my most severe mentally ill clients died on the streets that year. And I think I was really angry, like, who is going to do something about this? And so I think over time I realized, well, I guess I'm going to do something about this. But I'm also kind of asking everyone out there that we all should have a duty to do something about this because this was Hollywood. This is the place where tourists across the world go and that we all have a duty to look around us and go, that's not okay in kind of this greatest place on the earth where Hollywood is. Exactly. No, and yeah, you and I are, are kindred souls in, in that respect. So I, and that's 12 people that you know about, yeah. right? That's and those were only ones I had really good relationships with. Yeah. So as we come to a close, I want to, again, give you just the opportunity to summarize like the elevator speech of your paper. So you're, you, you've met a key legislature at the state, uh, state capitol, uh, who's on the whatever committee is dealing with rewriting the LPS Act because so many attempts have been tried and this is just fraught with a lot of emotion. And it is complicated, as you point out. So you're on the elevator and you, you say, this is what I think needs to be done. Summarize your paper in an elevator speech. All right. I would say... The LPS Act needs to focus on a few things. We need to focus on a least restrictive alternative for all individuals before we go to the fact of conservatorship. We need to relook at what an LPS designated facility is and really think about other models that could work. And we have to go beyond just having conservatorship as the only model for us. Um, I also think you need to look at the term grave disability, do we really just want to look at food, clothing, and shelter? And are those terms really targeted towards those who are poor and hungry and homeless rather than the individuals that we're trying to help that are throughout our community? So and look there, at all of that. That's excellent. And and there has been 
an attempt to try to add medical condition in that list of food, clothing, shelter, and medical condition. Yeah. And I think that's, there's, there's some good in that. Um, I worry that when we push all that just to change one word, that we might be missing a larger purpose of, isn't all of this a little messed up? And isn't it a lot more confusing than just adding the word health we think is going to fix things? So I would just be a little more cautious about that. But I do, I don't think there's something bad. I think it may have helped Ron. Um, so that's something to think about. Savannah, I'm always so inspired when I talk with you. You are a young woman who is wise. You're like an old soul. And um, even your life experience to this point is is pretty exciting. And I think it's preparing you in ways. I see you uh, uh, as I um, uh, kind of ponder how big these issues are and how it's hard to see. Are we going to make progress? Are we going to get to a place, you know, safe places for Ron to go? And I get a little discouraged until I talk to people like you because I do feel like it's the that's this is the new generation of leaders who are not going to accept the status quo and are going to employ whatever tools they have. In your case, it may be uh, becoming a lawyer and litigating key issues or people who might go into policy or housing construction or advocacy or run for office. So the next generation of leaders gives me great hope. And I'm just so thrilled that you were able to sit down with me today and share your work so far and uh, keep sending me your term papers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie. I really appreciate it. All right. Have a wonderful day. Spending time with Savannah and others like her who are at the early stages of their career in this space gives me hope for the role this generation can play in advancing bold system change. Discussions about changing the law governing LPS conservatorships are often fraught with emotion, but I hope that listeners to this interview will pay more attention and talk with people who are directly impacted, patients and families of loved ones living with serious mental illness in our communities. Next week, I'll be sitting down with Dr. Tom Insel, who just published a book that could not come at a better time. It is called Healing, Our Path from Mental Illness to Mental Health. Dr. Insel was known as the nation's psychiatrist for many years when he was head of the National Institute for Mental Health from 2002 to 2015. In his book, he reflects back over his career and he is introspective about where he might have gotten it wrong in the past. In his words, as head of NIMH, he says, quote, I misunderstood the problem but he provides clear and compelling evidence for what needs to change in the U.S. Thank you to Verdugo Sound and Aaron Stern for the technical support in producing this podcast, and thank you to supporters of Heart Forward who make this possible. I'll see you next week.